Morning po. Morning po and happy birthday, Sir Joel. Hi, good morning po, Sir. Morning, Thank sir. You. Thank you po. Okay, so, ayun o, may pa-birthday sa... <laughs> Oo nga, sorry, kitang kita na sa office po. <laughs> happy birthday, Sir. Thank you po, thank you po, Sir. So, um, again, uh, good morning po sa ating lahat and yeah, I hope we already had our lunch. Um, medyo nag-acid reflux kasi ako ngayon uh, kaya medyo masakit yung lalamunan ko ng konti because of the acid. Anyway, uh, we'll have our discussion for today. So last meeting, uh, our discussion is focused on nutrients but this time our focus is on water. So uh, after which we'll have temperature and uh, stress for uh, stress relations. Okay, so let me just pull out my screen for our for the presentation. Siguro bago natin ano, bago tayo mag-proceed, pagkanta kaya natin si Sir Joel ng happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, mag-pull out ako ng ano dito. <laughs> mag-pull out ako ng music dito. Sir, Mariah version. Mariah Carey version. <laughs> ng happy birthday. Hanapin ko ngayon. Ang happy birthday, Mariah Carey. Okay. Ito ba ito? Ah, sige. Birthday relations muna. <laughs> Kala, tara lang. Kala lang sa Spotify. Tara na naman. Uh, maging masaya yung birthday ni Sir Joel kahit nagkaklase. <laughs> Every Saturday, sir, nag pumapasok pa rin? Uh, hindi po. Wala naman po. Pero minsan dito po ako nag, nag, ano eh, minsan pumapasok kasi maingay minsan sa bahay, sir. Eh. Ah. Yeah. Yung mga aso, ganun. Mali ata yung na-pull out ko. Happy birthday. Wala sa Spotify, kaha, sa YouTube. Para may background music. na to, no? yung happy birthday lang na. No? <laughs> Masyadong maano yun, maalon. Maalon. Ayun, 
So happy thank birthday, you, thank Sir you po, Joel. Thank you po. Ano to eh? Sir, how how young are you? Four four. Four four. Oi, double. Bata pa, sir. It's a nice question, sir. How young? Ah, I like how... that. <laughs> Ayun po. So, happy birthday and I hope you have a very good day today. So, sana makapag-celebrate kayo, sir, ng mas maayos ng family mo within the day. Thank you po. Or Thank siguro you po. dapat mag-dismiss tayo na agad. Agad, Ay. no? <laughs> <laughs> Ayun. So, Sige po. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Sana na lang, sir, pag nag-face-to-face tayo, doon na lang yung pakain mo sa amin, sir. Ay, opo. Pag, <laughs> pag nagawi uli ako sa ano, dyan, sa uh, inyo. Sige po. So, ayun. So, I hope uh, makapag-celebrate pa ng mas mahaba si Sir Joel with his family. Okay, so let's proceed to our discussion para agad makauwi si Sir Joel. <laughs> Ako yung excuse. <laughs> Sige po. Thank you. Ayan. So, okay. So, this is our, this is the outline of our topic for today. So, we'll be talking about uh, water. So, what uh, water properties, water availability to organisms. Uh, we'll also be talking about uh, water potential. And also the plant roots and water acquisition plus water relations of plant cells. This is a sort of a review of, um, of our biology class uh, way back, probably in high school or in college. So, uh, but we'll focus more on, on those aspects na probably na bago na siya over time and uh, more specific on the processes, on the physiological uh, aspect of water relations. As well, know water is very much important pagdating sa, sa mga plants. Uh, water is one of the main components of the cells. So it maintains the rigidity of the leaves, of the stems, and then the roots. And it also, um, it's also part of the, the anabolism and the catabolism of catabolis, catabolism present in any organism, so including plants. So according to references, the proportion of water and earth and in living organisms is almost equal. So this is evident by showing that the cells is uh, that cells are cells components is mainly water. And on the outside, uh, we have cells also. Uh, we have water as a big chunk of, of the earth. Now, water is both an ingredient in anabolism as well as a product of catabolism. So when you, when you catalyze, when you build uh, macromolecules, one component of which is water, particularly in catabolism. Why? Because catabolism, yung ating mga enzymes, yung mga ating mga catalysts, um, water is needed. It acts as a medium para mag-function yung mga ating mga enzymes. And the role of water is very vital in maintaining the thermal budget of the biosphere, especially in the times of climate change, in the times of, of what we are experiencing right now, the global warming, water is very much essential. Um, consider our body uh, when, we, when, we, when we perspire, when we set, when we sweat, ang ginagawa natin is we always drink. So this is also similar with, with other organisms, particularly plants. So yung ating mga plants, yung lahat ng namawala for every transpiration that, it, that is occurring sa ating mga plants, uh, they need also water intake. So for every water loss, it is always compensated with water intake. And understanding such, yung water relations, it's important for us to understand yung how organisms adapt to different environments characterized by, of course, water scarcity, water excess, and water type. Now, this is quite, um, yung mga succeeding slides natin, um, quite technical. There are some formulas that will be presented uh, because we'll be talking more of how the water moves in the plant. 
Now, water availability to organisms. So may mga factors tayong kinoconsider dyan. And one of which is water movement. So water movement, water moves down concentration, uh, water moves across concentration gradients. Whether organisms loses or gains, water depends on water concentration gradients between organisms and the environment. So imagine for, for the earth, um, yung movement natin ng water, it always comes from the higher concentration to the lower concentration. Uh, we always hear the word osmosis. So ang movement natin ng water, it always come in this kind of gradient. Now, another factor is the climate or the microclimate of a certain region or a certain area. Now, for those examples, for those organisms living in tropical rainforests with high humidity, they experience excessive amounts of water available for them. You know this when um, yung soil natin very moist. Now, the organisms, on the other hand, do sa mga arid environments naman natin, they actually face acute water scarcity. So, ibig sabihin, may kakulangan ng tubig na naranasan doon sa arid environments. So, they need to store they, the, in terms of physiological and morphological aspects, they need to store water sa, sa system nila. Usually, they store it among their stem or among their leaves. So, evident ito sa mga, uh, sa mga plants living in the desert such as the cactus. Now, one important basic characteristics in determining water movement, uh, water movement is uh, relative humidity. So this relative humidity, uh, it, ang, ang tawag natin in a way, uh, ang relative humidity, this is the water content preser, present in the air. So yung ating water in the air, compute siya with this formula. So relative humidity is equal to water vapor density over saturation, uh, water vapor density times 100. So this is uh, on how to compute the relative uh, humidity. But we have to remember that as the water content in the atmosphere goes on the increasing, the water gradient between the hydrosphere or the living organism and the atmospheres go, uh, goes on decreasing. Now, this lead to the decreased water loss to the atmosphere. So, ibig sabihin, um, uh, actually, when we talk about uh, uh, relative humidity, very confusing means yan. Yung parang, uh, usually, you feel hot sometimes, even though mataas ang, kapag mataas ang relative humidity, where in fact, there is actually water content in the air. Now, the, yun yung pinaka-confusing pagdating sa relative humidity. I have a video here later presenting this kind of, um, to explain how confusing the definition of relative humidity is. Now, to continue, um, going back to our formula, uh, relative humidity, yung water vapor density, that is the mass of water vapor per unit volume of the air, and this is measured in water per uh, milligrams per uh, liter. So uh, H2O over liters or H2O over uh, cubic meter. So this is uh, the formula for the water vapor density. Now for the saturation water vapor density, this is the amount of water that the air can potentially hold changes with air temperature. So for hot air has more hot air has more potential to hold water vapor than the cold air. So ibig sabihin yung ating hot air mas mataas yung potential niya to hold the water as compared to the cold air. So this is the video that I'm talking about um, explaining why uh, relative humidity it's uh, it's it's not really what we think. Na when, kasi when we when we think of relative humidity, tuloy nga sabi ko kanina, um, dapat, we, dapat ang feeling natin is mas malamig because it's water. But actually, when the relative humidity is it's higher, iba yung pakiramdam natin on the ground. So this video will try to explain that 
um, that uh, that phenomenon. So let's let's watch it. The description to start listening. If you've ever paid close attention to the humidity levels on your phone's weather app, you might have noticed that they always seem to make no sense. Like, in the summer, your app can say there's 75% humidity and you'll be sticky and sweaty. But during winter, 75% might mean that your skin is super dry. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that the most common definition of humidity is kind of inconvenient, but there is a better way to think about it. It all comes down to the fact that your phone, and most weather channels, specifically report relative humidity. This number is measured in percentages, and it's the amount of moisture in the air compared to how much water the air can hold. And the key is, how much water the air can hold depends a lot on temperature. See, for water vapor to come out of the air, it has to go from a gas to a liquid usually by condensing onto something like dust or your window glass. And for something to go from a gas to a liquid, it has to lose energy. In other words, the molecules have to physically slow down. Well, when the air is warm, the water molecules in it contain a lot of energy. They're moving more than water molecules in cooler air. That means they're less likely to condense out of the atmosphere, and they end up hanging out in the air and making things feel all sticky. So temperature plays a big role in relative humidity, and it's why this stat usually isn't that useful in planning your day. If it's negative 10 degrees Celsius, the air can't hold as much moisture, so 75% humidity isn't actually that humid. But if it's 20 degrees, 75% humidity suddenly means there's a lot more water in the air to make things feel all muggy. If you want a number for humidity that isn't quite so relative, try the dew point temperature. This is the temperature at which water droplets or dew form on things like grass. In other words, it's the temperature at which the air is completely saturated with moisture. And the closer the dew point temperature is to the temperature outside, the stickier and more unpleasant it'll be. For reference, people react differently to dew points, but most folks are comfortable with a dew point of 10 degrees Celsius. And things get pretty humid and unpleasant around 15 to 21 degrees. So it's still a new scale to learn, but it's also consistent no matter how cold it is outside. Now, the big question is, if the dew point temperature is a great way to tell you how the outside world feels, why don't weather apps and weather channels use it? It's mostly a matter of history. Instruments that measure relative humidity predate the ones that measure dew points. Like, one of the first mechanical hygrometers, a device that measures humidity, appeared in 1783. And since these devices were widely available to the public and gave reliable measurements of relative humidity, the term, unfortunately, stuck around. You know what else is available to the public and gives reliable science inspiration? Music for Scientists, a tribute album to science inspired by the beauty of science. It was written and recorded by Patrick Olson, and if you want to check it out, I'd recommend starting off with the song Aristarchus in the Rain, which isn't about humidity, but it is about a scientist trying to make sense of this messy and cloudy world. If you want to check it out, look for Music for Scientists on all major music streaming services, or click the link below. Okay, so going back to our topic, doon sa relative humidity, we can say na uh, the relative humidity it's dependent on the temperature itself. So I experienced this sa well, I experienced probably this kind of relative humidity yung parang malagkit yung pakaramdam uh, when I was in in Laguna. So iba yung init, iba yung relative humidity sa dito sa Pampanga at saka sa Laguna. But yung init, uh, sobrang lagkit pagdating sa 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 Laguna. Uh, the the main reason it's actually the water vapor uh, coming from from the Laguna Lake. Laguna de Bae. So, why we are talking about this? Because water as I've mentioned, it's a very important element pagdating sa 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 mga plants. So this is how different crops uh, grow. This is how the different crops depend para sa buhay nila. Uh, I'm not sure if you have experienced this when you are setting to the field or when you are going to, to areas uh, such as pag nag-check kayo sa mga field. But uh, water, sometimes it's most of the problems that I experience when I talk to different farmers, 
ang problem daw nila is water. So, patubig. Yung nag, dun nagkukulang uh, minsan. So, I, I'm not sure what is the, particularly on rice, I'm not sure what is the the effort of the National Irrigation Agency, if I'm not mistaken, on, on this aspect. But going back to the technical aspects, when we talk about water, important yung water movement. And without checking or without understanding how water moves in a certain area, it will affect on how plants will also grow. Now, there are different ways or different um, types of water movement. We have the isos, isosmotic, hyposmotic, and hyperosmotic. So for isosmo, isosmotic, isosmotic uh, the concentration of water in the body fluids and external environment is alike. So there is no movement between organisms and their environment. Now, hyposmotic naman, concentration of water in body fluids is higher than the external environment. So organisms tend to lose water to the external environment. Hyperosmotic naman, the concentration of water in the body fluid is lower. So yung mismong sa loob ng organism is lower than the external environment. So the tendency is organisms tend to be water flooded. So nalulunod sila due to the movement of external water toward their body fluids. So um, ang importante natin para hindi masira yung mga ating mga halaman or at yung mga organisms per se, yung hyposmotic and hyperosmotic. Yun yung dapat natin maintindihan. Because there are other organisms that will of course, will will experience, they will be flooded. Baga malulun sila kapag sobrang dami ng tubig nila. Water, there's water in excess. Now, when moving along its concentration gradient, water produces osmotic pressure and uh, we measure it in, in Pascals. So there's a difference in the water concentration across semi-permeable membrane that determines the strength of the osmotic pressure. So this is very biology. So the larger the differences in the concentration of fluids between two aquatic environments across a semi-permeable membrane, the higher the osmotic pressure can be generated. So in order to maintain a proper internal environment, the or aquatic organisms may, must expend energy. Now the amount of the energy expended by the aquatic organisms is proportional to the magnitude of the osmotic pressure between them and their environment. So ano tong, uh, we'll, we are talking about aquatic environments, we are talking about aquatic organisms. But uh, this is a way para lang maintindihan natin how this water moves from one environment to another environment. So this is also very similar for plants. Of course, yung, yung plants natin, uh, they are usually they are planted in the soil. Now, yung soil naman natin, meron ding presence din yan ng water. And sometimes, uh, not sometimes, but oftentimes, we, we still water our plants. So, paanong dami ng tubig yung kailangan natin ilagay doon sa mga halaman natin para hindi sila malunod? Because everything will always lies down on the osmosis. Now, let's talk about water potential. Water potential, this is the, uh, the potential uh, or the capacity of water to do work. Example natin dyan, uh, sabi dito, flowing water has its kinetic to do work. Anong ibig sabihin yan? When there is a flowing water, it actually releases energy. So that's how hydrothermal energy is being formed. That's how uh, we can create yung, ano It's actually a, forgot the term, yung umiikot na may tubig. So that's what we call water potential. So the capacity of water to do work will always depend on the free energy content. Now, the flow of the water from the hyposmotic to the hyperosmotic direction, down osmotic gradients reveal that it has capacity to do work. I-simplify ko na lang itong explanation dito. Pag sinabi natin hyposmotic water, it has more free energy than the hyperosmotic water. Now, ang hypoosmotic water is purer than the hyperosmotic water. Now, yung pure water natin, mas marami siyang energy and from uh, energy content as compared to the seawater. But uh, ang movement nito, it will be always from the pure water 
to the saline water. It's because the pure water has more energy as compared to the saline water. Now, ang an natin dito, uh, the formula for water potential is MPA is equal to PA times 10 to 6. So water potential is denoted by the symbol psi. So PSI, this symbol psi, uh, uh, ang symbol, this is a symbol similar to a trident. So uh, rooted from Poseidon. So the water potential of pure water is set at zero, which is the highest value of water potential in nature. So halimbawa, if magdidilig ka ng tubig, pure water, a pure water sa halaman, so zero yon. Then for your roots, ang kanyang, uh, ang kanyang water potential is mas mababa. So ang movement mo, yung zero, uh, dahil mas mataas yung energy content niya, papunta dun sa roots, paakyat yung movement ng water. So as you move doon sa halaman, bumababa yung water potential. But since you are, your water has more free energy, so yung water mo is paakyat yung movement niya. So ibig sabihin, yung water, yung nag, uh, the energy in the water, yun yung nag-fuse kung paano papasok yung, uh, yung water sa loob ng isang halaman. Now, uh, I have here, uh, I love this, this channel. Uh, ito yung lagi kong ginagamit before in, in my class, uh, talking about biology. This is a very good explanation doon sa, sa, sa water potential. So let's watch it together. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this video, I'm going to talk about water potential, which is really what it sounds like. It's the potential energy of water per unit area compared to pure water. And so it allows us to figure out where water is going to flow due to osmosis, gravity, um, pressure, even surface tension. And so it allows us to figure out if water is going to flow into the cell or not. And so we measure it using something called psi or PSI. And a quick way to remember that is that Poseidon, who was this Greek god of the oceans carried a trident and it looks a lot like the trident that we use to represent um, water potential or psi. Now psi is going to be equal to the psi s which is solute potential and pressure potential but before I scare you off with a bunch of formulas let's get started and talking about how water potential works. Let's first talk about osmosis and if you don't know this you may want to watch the video on osmosis but if you wanted to do something really cruel you could pour salt on a slug don't do it, it'll kill it, but what it would do is it would shrivel up that slug. And so what would happen is it would pull water out of the slug. Now why does that occur? Let's zoom in to the surface of the slug. So let's say this represents a cell membrane on the outside of the cells of the slug. We've got water on the outside, water on the inside, and let's say we add just one crystal of sodium chloride or salt. Sodium chloride is going to be made up of two ions that are bonded together using an ionic bond. And when we add that to the water, something weird happens. They'll break apart into their two ions. We've now got the chlorine ion and the sodium ion, the negative and the positive charge. And the negative charge is immediately going to be surrounded by the positive parts of the water, and the negative sides of the water are going to surround the positive sodium. But look what it did. It opened up all these areas. So it decreased the water potential above the slug or on the surface of the slug. And so now we have areas where the water inside the slug can move into that. And it's more radical than I have in this simple kind of a diagram. And so what it's going to do is it's going to move water outside the slug. And so we measure water potential on either side of that membrane. On the outside, it's going to be negative 40 bars. And on the inside, it's going to be negative 5 bars. Now know this, pure water is going to be right at 0 bars of water potential. And so the water is going to flow from here into here. So the water is going to flow from an area of high water concentration to low co concentration. Or it's going to flow from an area of high water potential now to low water potential. And that's what you want to remember. Water is always going to flow from high to low water potential. And so this drives water even up a tree. And so if you were to pour some distilled water below a tree, that's going to have a water potential of zero bars. But the roots are going to be around negative two. And that's because they have a lot of solutes in, or salts inside them. And so the water is going to flow in through osmosis. But the stems are going to have even a greater 
excuse me, a lower water potential and the leaves as well and even the atmosphere. And so the water is moving up a tree along this water potential gradient. Now what's driving that? We're evaporating all the water up at the top, so there's not much water there at all. Really, really low water potential if we were to look at the leaves of the plant. And so now let's get to those equations. So water potential is built on two things. It's built on the solute potential. And so think of that as like water flowing through osmosis and then the pressure potential. And that's like physical squeezing of the cell. And so solute potential is going to drop as we increase the number of solutes in that area. And so if I were to add just two little bits of sodium chloride or salt to it, what would that do to the solute potential? It's going to drop that. It's going to get a lower value. Why is that? Remember, we're opening up spaces in here for water, so we're going to have less water. Let's say we add a whole bunch of solutes to it. That's really going to decrease that solute potential. And so maybe it's going to be around negative 5 bars. So that's due to osmosis, or that push of osmosis. What about the, the pressure potential? Well, that's a physical pressure. And so imagine that water keeps flowing into this cell, and let's make this a plant cell. So water's going to keep flowing in. That's going to push out on that cell, but it doesn't explode. Our cells would explode, but that has a cell wall around the outside of it. And so that wall is now going to start exerting a pressure to the inside. And so what that's going to do is create what's called a pressure potential. And so we measure that in bars as well. So let's say that's two bars. Why is it a positive value? Remember, that's going to be pushing in. It's going to want to push water out of that kind of an area. And so those two things, if we add those together, is going to be our water potential. What would be the water potential in this case? It would be negative five bars plus two bars. So it's going to be negative three bars. That's the overall water potential. And those two things are going to determine if water flows into a cell if it doesn't. Sometimes you'll be asked to do a little bit more detail here on the solute potential and there's an equation for that which in my class I would not want you to memorize but let's throw that up here right now. So solute potential is equal to negative I CRT. So we got to go through each of those parts the I, the C, the R, and the T. Let's start with the ionization constant. Ionization constant is not going to have units associated with it. It's just a factor and it's always going to be somewhere from 1 to 2 sometimes including 1. And so if we were to look at sodium chloride, remember sodium chloride is one molecule when it's outside of the water, but when you add it to the water, it's going to break apart into two ions. And so the reason we're multiplying it times two is if you add one mole of sodium chloride, it's really like adding one mole of chloride ion and one mole of sodium ion. And so we have to multiply that times two. Now it's really easy if we're dealing with something like sucrose, which is just table sugar. That's going to have an ionization constant of 1 because when you add sugar to water, it just stays as sugar. So we don't have to multiply anything. So again, if we increase the ions, we're increasing the I, and that's going to give us a lower solute potential. Okay, what about concentration? Obviously, the more of the stuff we add to the water, that's going to increase uh, or decrease rather the solute potential. And so moles per liter in concentration is going to be what we measure for C. And so if you add the, the molarity, so let's say something is a one molar solution, that means there's one mole per liter. Next thing we have in our equation is the pressure constant. Pressure constant is just that. It's always going to be the exact same thing and it's always going to be 0.0831. I wouldn't memorize it. These, um, these units at the end are going to be important as we solve a quick problem. And then the next one's going to be the temperature. Obviously it's important that we, if we increase the concentration that that's going to decrease solute potential. But if we increase temperature then the molecules are going to be bouncing around more readily and so that's also going to decrease our water potential. And so when we measure that in this equation we use it Kelvin. And so what you're going to do is take the Celsius degrees and add 273. If you don't do that you're simply going to get the wrong answer. And so knowing that, let's throw you a quick problem. So let's say we have a molar concentration of sugar solution in an open beaker. That'll become important in just a second. It's a 0.2 molar uh, concentration. And what they're asking you to do is calculate the solute potential at 22 degrees Celsius. And so on the AP exam, you're going to get these two things. They're going to give you water potential, which we already went over. That's equal to the pressure potential plus the solute potential. They're going to explain that here. And then this is even the equation for the solute potential which is negative I CRT. And so how do you solve that? Let me show you how I would solve it. First thing I would do is I would plug everything in. What's my I? My I is going to be 1. Um, that's just... Uh, hi.
So, the last part more on computation and and we don't need it in our discussion for today. So, water potential. Uh, this this uh, this video it simplifies the discussion. Pat bakit pakiat yung yung water natin from from the soil. Okay. So. Okay. So this time, we proceed naman tayo with the water movement behavior in in the soil. So the water movement in behavior, according to the reference uh, that I'm using, it's somewhat complex. So the concentration of the solutes in soil water is very low, allowing the matrices forces to play a major role in determining water potential. So the water, uh, the the movement of water is dependent on the following, particularly on the soil type, mainly on soil soil texture at saka yung kanyang pore size. Now, with larger pore size, such as those sand and loam soil, uh, the, the water potential is lower, so it's less. If the pore size is smaller, uh, particularly doon sa mga clay soil, the matrix forces will be of higher magnitude. That's why for those coarser soils with lower matrix forces, they do not hold water as compared to the soil that has a capacity to hold water. So this is the relationship of the plants, the water, and the soil uh, in terms of the movement ng, ng water per se. Okay. Now, may I ask, ah, ito yung uh, image na pinakita kanina. Uh, this is a similar image shown by uh, the, the, in the previous video. Now, this shows how the movement from the soil paakyat doon sa ating atmospheric. Now, across, diba, sa, sa taas dito, there is actually evaporation. There is also transpiration occurring doon sa ating mga sa ating mga leaves. Now, I would like to ask the class before proceeding doon sa ating uh, next slides. Uh, in your experience, when you talk to the farmers uh, experiencing drought, kasi nagkakaroon ng tagtuyot, especially during summer season. So, what are the common practices that they usually do addressing yung yung drought na to? Because, uh, as you all know, drought will always affect the, the crop production. So, based on your experience based on 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 different visits that you've done uh in different places in your area how do the farmers cope up with with this kind of uh phenomenon that they are experiencing uh, who wants to go first yes ma'am ma'am teresita ma'am test Sir, ang um, napansin ko din po sa seven years kong experience bilang um, agricultural technologist o technician po sa baryo, um, yung mga farmer po, maalam na sila, nararamdaman ata nila kung talaga pagkakadrought, ganyan. Ang ginagawa po nila, hindi nila kaagad na variety, yung mabilis anihin. Mm. Meron po yung teknik nila ang unang ginagawa. Tapos po, um, hindi na po nila masyadong inaarado yung lupa sir parang um, ilang beses bang araduhin yung lupa parang madalian po ang lahat ganun kasi nga po hinahabol nila yung ulan kagaya po ngayon uh, mag October po November anihan hindi na po nila pagpapahingayin yung lupa yung following period na tinatawag mm. once po na may dumating na malakas na ulan, aaraduhin po nila yan kaagad-agad. Tapos sasabugan na po nila. Hindi na po lipat tanim. Sasabugan oh. na po nila yun, sir. Yeah, so in a way, Try they address... Yeah, opo. So in a way, um, ang nangyari lang naman, ang nangyari naman, going back to our previous uh, previous topic, yung last week, it will certainly affect the nutrients present kasi diba tuloy-tuloy kung baga walang pahinga. So the crop production is actually uh, really addressed. So yun pala yung technique nila. So they will choose um, those crops na mabilis anihin. So a variety, particularly in rice, I think, no? So how about the others? Thank you po, Ma'am Teresita. Thank you. How about for the others? 
si Ma'am Trisha. Ah, uh, yun, Sir. Sir Rafael, sige. Uh, sir, sa experience ko po yung iba, is gumagamit po sila ng mulch para makonserve po nila yung soil moisture ng malaman. Uh, sorry, Sir Rafael. Medyo okay. nag... Ano lang po. Sorry. Sir? Hello, yes. Ayan uh, po. Uh, sir, yung ibang farmers po na napuntahan ko is gumagamit po sila ng mulch or mulching para makonserve po yung uh, conserve po yung moisture ng halaman. Ay, yung lupa, sir. Okay. So, they, they practice mulching uh, yes. so that ma, ma ano yung soil moisture. Okay. So, thank you, Sir Rafael. How about si Ma'am Trisha sa Pora? Knowing Pora, it's very arid most of the places. Yes po, sir. Sa amin naman po, uh, especially sa mga rice farmers po natin, they practice alternate wetting and drying. And paminsan po, uh, sa, sa isang hectarea nila, uh, kung dati kapag hindi siya uh, wala po silang na-experience na drought, tinatamnan po nila lahat ng rice. Ngayon, kapag during drought, uh, konti lang po yung tinatamnan nila ng rice for their consumption sa family. And then, nagsiship sila into other commodities. Okay. So, they, uh -huh. they diversify yung kanilang uh, uh, yung crop diversification. Yung yes, ginagawa po. nila. No? Okay. Thank you, uh, Ma'am Tricia. How about si Ma'am Bell in Aurora? Though in Aurora, I'm not sure in terms of the climate. Uh, kasi yung climate is baka medyo, I think, mas, mas mahaba yung atang wet season ninyo, Ma'am Bell. Hello po, Ma'am Bell. Hello po, good morning po. Good morning po. Ayan po. So, uh, dito naman po sa amin, Doc, ah, uh, wala naman pong gaanong problem in terms po sa water dahil yeah. uh, uh, at saka yung pong aming location nga po uh, dito sa Aurora is kakaiba. So yung mga farmers po dito sa amin is nakakapagtanim po three times. Uh, three times po sa isang taon. So for example po yung saray, so nakaka three cropping season po dito sa amin. So, uh, diretso lang po yung, yung water in terms po dun sa pag-ulan. So, meron po kasi dito na maraming ilog. So, yun po yung pinagkukunan po sa amin ng tubig. Yeah. So, I think yun nga, uh, iba yung climate type in Aurora. So, since this That's is very fun. near to, to the Pacific Ocean, uh, may portion talaga na hindi mararanasan yung yung crisis. Ito yung, I, I mean the, the, the drought. So ito rin yung nakita ko when also sharing my experience doon sa Saray project namin na one of our sites, it's in Bingalan. Hindi masyadong ma, I mean moist talaga yung, yung lupa. Kasi makikita na basa talaga siya all throughout the year that we, we, we visited. Halos every month, eh, meron kaming visit sa area. Yes. Thank you, thank you Ma'am Bell. Uh, uh, I would like to hear from, ano, from Sir John Eric in terms of this. What are the usual uh, like dito, mga na-encounter mo when you talk to, to the farmers? And considering this water, probably water excess or water scarcity, that they they might encounter. Yes po. Um, good morning po sa lahat. So basic sa ano po uh, sa aking paglilipot ano sa in my experience din naman na, nasabi na po halos yung mga ginagawa. So there is gumagamit ng mga varieties na early maturing, nagda-diversify. Pero madagdag ko lang po in terms of rice, um uh, Meron po kasing, uh, minsan, uh, isa po sa mga technologies na aking in-implement is the aerobic rice technology. So, it, it is a technology intended for uh, drought po kasi nga uh, mas maaga or sumasabay sila sa panahon. So, onset of the early season, uh, of the rainy season, 
unang patak ng ulan, uh, nagtatrim na sila ng palay and then it is much less na much less dun sa pag pag prepare no lupa. Uh, yun po yung technology in Bulacan. Uh, and then for my uh, ano po kasi, i-relate ko na lang din po ito dun sa case study ko on the subject of Dr. Norman. Uh, yun napuntahan ko pong rice uh, integrated rice farmer is Uh, if he is practicing drip irrigation even on rice. So, ayun po. So, uh, a strategy to cope up with ano, we, uh, in the loss of water or kulang yung tubig is yung mga technologies na nakikita doon sa farm nung aking ano, um, interview. So, yun po yung mga nakita na, uh, mga napansin ko po sa aking ano, sa in my experiences po. Thank you, Sir John Eric. So drip irrigation, it's one of the the technologies and other technologies that we use to to allow farmers. So it's a matter of how people are receptive now, receptive doon sa pagtanggap din sa mga technologies na to. So I think that's that's where I think other problems will lie. Right. Thank you, uh, Sir John Eric. How about si Sir Joel? Um, My question is on the level of the national government and particularly in the role of the ABAR in in doing research as related to to drought water loss. So what are the efforts now of the DA bar when the thing dito? Good morning po. Um just to share lang po. Uh, in fact, ito pong ating issue sa tubig is really A universal one, I should believe, and it affects so many sectors. So, yeah, there was a time po that we had the chance to, actually hindi po dito eh, uh, we had the chance to benchmark in other country, uh, particularly po sa India. Kasi we all know that India is a mostly arid and semi-arid um, country. Uh, ang nakita po namin doon sa ginagawa sa mga water shed nila. In fact, yung mga farmers, in fact, we were able to talk to the farmers there. Ang ginagawa po nila doon, which I think is not yet heavily promoted dito sa bansa, which we are trying to promote now, no, is yung aquifer recharging. Kasi um, sa atin po, I think the most common intervention, aside from what was already mentioned by our classmates, uh, yung mga mulching, yung mga AWDs, yung sometimes they do yung mga SFRs no yung mga small small far, reservoir no uh, they dig up some they dig up the soil and then they use it as a uh, con, um, conduit of water repository ng water pero ang problem po kasi doon yung storability ng tubig hindi naman siya ganun katagal kasi of course when you are experiencing so uh, yung hot weather mabilis din po maubos, maubos yung tubig eh. Whereas, ang ginagawa nila sa ibang bansa, like for example, sa India, if I'm not mistaken po, yung precipitation data nila doon, parang annually, less than 1,000 mm siguro eh, mga 600 mm of rain annually. As compared to the Philippines, mga 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 mm yan. Depende pa kung may bagyo. So, Uh, sa kanila, how are they able to manage growing their crops in that extreme conditions? Eh, it's because of that technology that they use. Uh, it's a very simple technology. Ang nakita namin doon, they just they call it parang bore, bore wells. Eh. May buta sa lupa. Of course, nagko-consult sila ng mga hydrologists nila kasi para mat- mat- matansya na saan ba yung water table. no So, pag may ulan, sahod talaga yung baba siya sa water table. So it is um, isolated from evaporation. So during lean months, doon lang sila gumagamit ng energy. They pump it out. No? So ganun kasimple po. So ibig sabihin, they're able to sustain somehow yung kanilang production. So um, dito po, in fact, meron din pong nasuportahan ng bar which I think, um, yeah, unahan ko na po siguro, I, I, this is the topic that I would wish to present sana next mm-hmm. week. Uh, may isang partnership po kami with, uh, I think, Phil Rice and IRI. May isang, but this one is a highly automated technology. Um, they, they use equipment 
na nakatusok sa lupa and it measures the moisture content of the soil at any particular time, point in time. So that pag nami-measure ng machine yung moisture ng lupa na medyo bumababa, then it signals to a central command center, medyo high-tech masyado yung ano nila, dinevelop. I don't know if this is farmer-friendly pa eh. Pero uh, it triggers something that there is a need for you to release water, pero in certain optimal amount lang. So hindi katulad ng ginagawa sa atin, pag irigasyon talaga, talagang babahain mo ng babahain. So doon po medyo precision yung approach. In fact, yan po yung isa rin naming gusto sa, well, sa DA in general, uh, yung precision agriculture. So yun po, um, I'm trying to still get some information on that project. Uh, meron silang tinawag, otomon yata yung tawag ng software. Eh. So sabi ko nga kanina, I don't know if this is really farmer friendly in terms of because this is costly. Mm. Yun nga po yung isang challenge natin sa lalo na sa innovation work no. When we are doing innovation, kaya lang there is a cost to innovation eh. Is it is it really for the farmers no? Is it worth investing in certain innovations or is it or do we just let the private sector handle it, di ba? And then we will just contract it out with them. Kasi yung farmers natin, hindi nila number one, hindi naman nila naintindihan yan. Pangalawa, kaya ba nilang mag-invest dyan? So tama yung nasabi nga ni Sir kanina, yung mga farmers. And I would assume those are the small farmers yung nire-refer ni Sir. So yun po, just to share a few things lang po. No? Um, uh, we do hope talaga po, kami po sa day, in fact si Sir Eric po, taga DA din siya, ay talagang makapagsulong tayo ng ganitong intervention. Uh, lalo pa ngayon at um, ang sinasabi natin presidente ay may crisis no pagkain. So water is one important element. Hindi pa masyadong natatouch yan. Puro fertilizer ang pinag-uusapan eh. No, yun, yung yung kwan. Yun lang po sir. Thank you yeah. po. Thank you. Thank you Sir Joel. Yeah, um related doon sa project. Uh, I'm not sure if Saray already have this, but I saw already in there parang parang materials yung doon sa water monitoring nila sa soil. Uh, in terms, they have already the prototype. I'm not just yet sure kung gano'n na ka, ka, ka-develop yung prototype nila for, for this. Kasi they have this mechanism na parang meron silang sensor tapos iti-text si farmer kung need na niyang magdagdag ng water or what. So, I think parang sigurong similar yung approach na, no, sir. So, UPLB has been developing that since 2016, but I'm not just sure on on the on how developed it is now. Ah, uh, kasi hindi ko rin siya nakita uh, on the first hand. I just saw in their materials. Yeah. So I think uh, making a user friendly technology. I've been telling also this to my undergraduate students. Now, uh, there are a lot of innovation that we're doing, but sometimes they tend to fail because it's not something that the farmers or the low, the the people on the ground can actually use or easily grasp it so sometimes uh, iba yung pangangailangan nila or the innovation that we need it is something that they can really understand to their to their to their level kasi of course for for us in the, in the academy in the research world madaling intindihin sa atin itong mga to but for those people on the ground that unfortunately they don't have any parang they are quite illiterate in terms of this uh, matter so doon tayo nagkakaroon ng parang disparity or a gap kaya nagkakaroon ng sometimes uh, hindi na inaccept ng ng isang community yung ganitong classing technology even though on the part of the researchers and on the part of the government and on the part of the academy on, on our end, uh, we are trying to help them. So I think uh, ang challenge ngayon sa atin is to make it more simple in a way they could easily understand it and how it will work. So ganun yung tingin ko ang gusto nilang makita. And of course, they want to see the end results as up. Yun yung, ano eh, yun yung laging experience natin when we usually talk to, talk to the farmers. So it's a good thing that there are a lot of ways, a lot of technologies that we use now in addressing water loss and, of course, in water excess. 
kasi yung mga may experience naman natin, considering Philippines is a disaster-prone country, particularly to flooding, uh, marami tayong mga ayun, marami tayong mga uh, farmers recently that experienced na nasira yung pananim nila. Um, nasira yung pananim nila because uh, nabagyo sila. So, one of which, my, my father, uh, in our family, in our family, meron din kasi kaming pala yan. So, uh, na-devastate din yung pala yan namin in Perlac. Uh, mas konti yung naging production namin. So, I'm thinking, you know, I'm just thinking out, thinking out loud na uh, if you have a means to cover this this pala yan during rainy season, no? yung parang tipong medyo futuristic lang yung naisip ko kasi nanonood ako ng Doraemon dati. So yung bang tatakpan mo yung yung area kapag may bagyo just to cover all of these plants and protect them. So I hope we have that kind of mechanism in the future. It's very futuristic but I think it's not feasible. It's not yet feasible the technology that we have. Pero yung tipong ganun, yung para may hologram effect na they will cover it during rainy season. Medyo ambitious lang yung yung nakikita ko and very futuristic. And I hope we have that kind of mechanism sana in the future because this is how we protect yung mga yung mga farmers. So I'm just really watching this yung Draymond kasi uh, favorite ko yan nung nung bata ko. So meron kasing isang episode doon that they covered a certain hall na it's it's sunny day doon sa area na yon but it's actually raining hard doon sa labas nung nung cover na yun. So I hope we will have that kind in the future because it will really help our farmers. Sir, may I add po? Yes, sir. Um, kasi I, I heard you mention about something that would protect no, yung, yung pinaka-area, no, production area. In fact, meron po kaming isang, well, sa DA to, hindi naman po sa DA bar. Meron pong isang uh, nasuportahan po ang DA. But it is not really for protecting a, a production area. But it's more of a storage area. Mm-hmm. For example, yung mga na-harvest mo or buto or seeds na tinatago mo. It's called the monolithic dome. In fact, mm-hmm. ayun ang tawag nila. So you can actually, pwede nyo po siyang search sa Google, makikita po nyo yung... Mono- I, I, seen, I have seen one structure nung nandun kami sa Nueva Vizcaya, sa isang uh, experiment station natin doon. Um, ang challenge ko nga doon sa researcher, sabi ko, if this, can, if, if this would uh, really protect uh, the materials... Kasi kahit daw Category 5 or yung pinakamataas ng typhoon, eh, kaya niyang i-withstand eh. So kasi ang structure niya very aerodynamic siya. Uh, may parang iglo na style niya. So kahit malakas yung hangin, wala. Uh, lalapas lang siya. So hindi siya resistant doon sa kwan. So sabi ko, kung pwede to sa ano, storage, can we explore this at least, sabi ko, yung indoor farming. Halimbawa, yung mga vertical Alibawa, mm-hmm. hydroponic style. Kasi I, I, seen, I have seen many documentaries already. Indoor, no? Um, yung, ang challenge kasi dyan, pag indoor, yung light eh. Yung tubig, wala na yan. Kasi yung hydroponic, kung hydroponics niya, mm-hmm. yung solution, nandun na yung fertilizer minsan. Pero yung light, nagawa nila ng paraan eh. Yung LED light lang, ang ginagamit nila. Kasi ang importante lang naman dyan, ma-isolate mo dun sa spectrum, ano yung kailangan ng halaman. So nagawa nila yan. So artificial lighting, it, it allows for the growth even without sunlight. So sabi ko, kung pwede yan, ting, pwede bang tingnan nyo yan sa loob ng monolithic dome? Kasi at least yung production niya, kahit all year round ka, kahit dumaan yung bagyo dyan, eh hindi yan dada pa. Pero syempre, yung mga malalakihang plantation level like rice, mahirap yata. Yeah, medyo mahirap pa. Hindi <laughs> <laughs> ka pwede sa loob ng ganun structure. Walang economy of scale doon. So ayun lang sir, na-share ko lang kasi yeah. baka rin sir dun sa kwan. Okay, yep. so thank you, Sir Joel. I think Sir John Eric meron din natin share. Sir John Eric? Yes po, ayun. Uh, na, naalala ko lang regarding doon sa monolithic dome. Meron kasing meron, meron kami farmer association na natap, natulungan uh, the problem na meron men- monolithic dome. The problem po is hindi nila alam uh, ay, the problem is parang hindi nila nagagamit. So, tama nga yung sinabi ni Sir Joel, parang pwede siyang gamitin, i-repurpose, i-repurpose natin siya into being productive. So, ano, ma-share ko lang, yung ginawa namin dun sa monolithic dome, dahil hindi siya, uh, maganda, hindi siya masyado napapasukan ng even the uh, sunlight po. Uh, we've put mushrooms, 
since mushrooms uh, required a dim light or at least no light at uh, no light in that sense ayun so uh, uh, for the sharing lang din naalala ko lang na ayun nag, nagamit namin siya and it's very good for ma- ano mushroom and even though na may bumagyo yung lumaan na bagyo hindi nasira yung kanilang production so tuloy-tuloy pa rin naman so it's a good ano po it's a good initiative po the, and the fill rice hat fill rice po at nagbigay nun. So, parang repurposing this this monolithic donut. At least we have that kind of effort. Tama si Sir Joel um, kanina na uh, yung, ay dito, if you can do it in a backyard farming, I think mas feasible yon. And uh, ang scale, let's say, if your scale is just like for a rice, medyo mahirap yon kasi hektar yung lupa. Yung kailangan natin for that. It will entail cost as well. Um, and hopefully this this effort, this kind of effort, uh, will go outside more to a larger, in a larger scale. And so thank you for your sharing. May natutunan din ako today about that. I'll I'll search about this monolithic dome later. Okay, so let's go back to our slides. Thank you. So let's talk about the plant roots and water acquisition. So as as I've been discussing since nutrient relations. Yung root development, yung roots natin, yung root system, these are important components of a certain plant. Um, it doesn't only take up yung mga nutrients, but also it take up water. So there is a definite relationship between the root development and water acquisition. Now, water availability in an ecosystem is also affected or influenced by the root development. So reciprocally, the extent of root, grow, uh, root growth greatly influences water ac- accessibility to the plants. So kapag mas malawak yung kayang scope ng ating roots, mas malawak, mas malawak or mas maraming nutrients, at the same time, the, the, the water will become more available to them. So that's how important roots are. And if water availability in the habitat is plentiful, so the root development in native plants might not be as much as in case of their counterparts in the arid and semi-arid areas. So yung, in terms of uh, on, on, the, on the adaptation of the plants, uh, for those in the arid and semi-arid areas, mas complex, mas, mas mahaba yung root development nila because these roots will try to find water or nutrients in, in the soil as compared to those areas na readily available yung water for them. Now, root development is greatly associated with climate. So the climate itself determines the availability. When we talk about availability, this includes deficiency or an availability of water for the plants. These are just some of the examples. So plants occurring in dry climates tend to develop deeper root systems than those in moist, moist climates. The root biomass proportion of a plant thus is also greater in plants occurring in dry climates than those in moist climates. So where, uh, ito naman, another is wherever the water table is very deep, as in the deserts, top roots of sh- some shrubby species can extend up to 30 meters down into the soil. Kasi, as I mentioned a while ago, they will look for water. Extra growth of the roots in water scarce habitats helps the plants provide them access to water available in deeper layers of, of the land. Now, only those plants that can grow uh, that can grow their roots deeper enough into soil profile to harp on soil moisture and can survive in drier habitats. So the greater the root biomass. Contributes, the maintain, uh, contributes to maintain stable and higher leaf water potential in the plants growing in dry habitat. So the lower root biomass, on the, hod- on the other hand, tend to decrease leaf water, water potential. Now, this is um, another short video on, on the movement of the water in the plants. So in the plants, uh, when we talk about cells, ang maririg natin dyan is xylem and phloem. So... One, uh, these plants are responsible for the water uptake or movement, yung transport ng ating uh, ng, ng water from the roots up to the up to the leaves. So this is a very short video on explaining this movement of water.
Hi guys! Before we get into it, I just want to show you the syllabus dot points that are relevant for this video. This is just so you can get a bit of an idea as to where this video fits into the big picture. As you can see, we're going to be focusing on how materials are moved around plants. We'll start off with the definition of what vascular tissue is and how it structures in plants. Once we've got that down, we'll move on to the cohesion tension theory, which explains the movement of water in plants. We'll save the source to synth theory and some exam tips for the next video. Let's get into this one. In biology, multicellular refers to an organism that consists of more than one cell, such as an animal or plant. For survival, all of the different cells in a multicellular organism must work together. You can think about it as like a game of soccer. To win, you need defenders, attackers and a goalie doing their own different jobs. So our soccer players are just like the cells in a multicellular organism. Individual cells perform special tasks which allow the whole organism to survive. But during the game, the soccer players are going to get thirsty. They're working pretty hard. But even in the breaks, they can't run off the field to get water or a towel. Instead, they have a water boy who runs up to them whilst they're on the field. And guess what? It's exactly the same in multicellular organisms. Individual cells don't usually have access to the nutrients they need. There's no way oxygen would ever diffuse into your bone cells. This leads us to vascular systems, which is a fancy name for a transport system. The vascular system consists of cells whose job is to supply other cells with nutrients and remove waste. All large multicellular organisms need vascular systems because otherwise there will be no way for all of the cells to get the nutrients they need. For this stop point, we're just going to be checking out the vascular system in plants. The vascular system in plants consists of three kinds of tissue, which are xylem, phloem and cambium. Xylem tissue consists of cells which grew to form continuous tubes when they were alive. Once the tubes have formed, the xylem cells die to become hollow. So basically, xylem tissue consists of dead, continuous, hollow tubes. These tubes have spiral thickening. Spiral thickening consists of lignin, which is a substance that is deposited in a spiral pattern around the xylem tubes to make them extra strong and rigid. Xylem tissue transports water and mineral ions from the roots towards the leaves of the plant, which we explain using the cohesion tension theory. We will look at this in a moment. Phloem tissue is another vascular tissue found in plants. It consists of living sieve tube cells, which are joined by sieve plates to form a continuous tube. Surrounding these are companion cells, which help keep the sieve tube cells alive. The job of phloem tissue is to translocate or move sugar and some other organic molecules through the plant. We explain this using the source to sink theory, which we'll check out in the next video. The last major vascular tissue in plants is the cambium tissue. All you need to know about cambium tissue is that it makes new xylem and phloem. So we have three vascular tissues in plants, the xylem, phloem and cambium. These then parcel together to form vascular bundles. So again, the cambium creates the xylem and phloem, which are just tubes that are used to transport water and sugars respectively. Now these vascular bundles form a network through the plant, kind of like the blood vessels in your own body. Now we know what a vascular system is in plants, let's go on to the cohesion tension theory. I've already given it away, but just to make sure we all get it, the cohesion tension theory is the theory that is used to explain the movement of water in plants. To start off with, let's set some ground rules. One of the most important things you should keep in mind is that the movement of water through plants is a passive process. That is, the plant doesn't have to put in any energy to transport water. Because of this, the plant can't control where the water goes. Water can only move from the roots towards the leaves. But why is it this way and not the other way around? Now, a lot of this theory comes down to what's going on at a molecular level, so we're going to need to be zooming in on a section of the roots. This is the root tissue. This is a section of vascular bundle. These blue circles represent water and the orange background represents soil. Now we're looking at the roots, which is where it all starts. 
Water moves from the surrounding soil into the xylem by a process called osmosis. Hopefully you remember that osmosis refers to the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. But the water doesn't just move wherever it wants. Nature always wants a balance. To achieve this, the water molecules can only move from areas of high water concentration to areas of low water concentration. In this case, the soil has a higher water concentration than the inside of the roots, and so the water moves across into the roots. Once the water is inside the plant, there are four main mechanisms which are responsible for transporting it from the xylem in the roots towards the leaves. These are root pressure, adhesion, cohesion and transpiration pool. We said just before that water enters the xylem in the roots by osmosis. This increases the number of water molecules in the roots. So, you can see that the roots have a heap more water in them compared to the rest of the plant. The roots have a high water concentration, and the rest of the plant has a relatively low water concentration. Because everything in nature wants to achieve a balance, water will then passively diffuse away from this area of high water concentration to areas of low water concentration. That is, the water moves from the roots towards the leaves via the xylem. The next main mechanism for the cohesion tension theory is adhesion, also called capillarity. This just refers to the fact that water will tend to adhere or stick to the walls of the xylem tubes. We really don't want to go too far into the physics behind this, but basically the fact that the water is pushing sideways rather than downwards means that it's easier for the other mechanisms to do their thing. And now we move on to cohesion. The cohesion mechanism refers to the fact that the water molecules within the xylem stick together very closely. In other words, the water molecules form a tightly bound, continuous stream which is easily moved up through the plant. Finally, transpiration pull. This is by far the most important driving mechanism for the movement of water and ions through the plant. Transpiration refers to the evaporation of water through the stomata in the leaves. A single stomata is called a stomate. Stomata are found on the leaves of the plant and their role is to control the exchange of gases between the plant and air. However, through these stomata, water also evaporates. You can think about it as like when Maya opens their doors on Boxing Day. You can't control who runs in. In the same way, the plant can't stop gaseous water escaping from the leaves. Now, you might think this is really bad and a waste. The plant actually loses about 90% of the water absorbed through the roots this way. But actually, this water loss is critical for the movement of water through the plant. Water is always evaporating from the leaves, so that the leaves always have a low water concentration. Because of this, water can be sucked up from the soil to try and balance the water out. So, that's the cohesion tension theory. Hopefully you can now see that this entire process required no energy, it was all passive transport. You might have also noticed that I didn't mention anything about the mineral ions. The trick is that they are just dissolved in the water and get pulled along with the water throughout the entire process. The only difference is that the plant uses some energy to pump the ions into the roots of the plant. And that's a wrap for this one guys. In this video we learned that for the survival of a multicellular organism, all of its cells must work together whilst performing their own specific functions. A vascular system consists of specialised cells whose job is to supply other cells with nutrients and remove waste. And the vascular system in plants consists of a network of vascular bundles which contain xylem, phloem and cambium tissue. Xylem tissue transports water and ions which we explain using the cohesion tension theory. In this theory, water enters the xylem in the roots by osmosis. The main mechanism responsible for transporting the water and minerals from the roots towards the leaves is transpiration pool, although it is assisted by root pressure, adhesion and cohesion. That's it for this video guys, stay on for the movement of sugars in the next video. Bye! Okay, so, so the video, uh, it's actually a very good video explaining uh, how the water moves so through the cells. So the movement of water natin into and out of plants is always determined by several factors. 
um, it may be biotic and also abiotic. So it's also important to know all of this because it is crucial as they influence the turgidity and growth of, of the plants. So in terms of root pressure, rotation, exudation from woods in the plants are also phenomenally influenced by water relations of the plants. But generally, uh, ang, ang pinaka uh, kun, uh, ang pinaka reason or pinaka ways ang pinaka way kung paano mag-move ang water it's because of the passive transport caused by osmosis. So through osmosis, this is how the energy or this is how the nutrients and water moves from the roots of the cell coming from the soil uh, going to the different parts of the of the of the plant. So um pinaka question natin actually at the end of the day is is this. So how water potential is important in food security. So may ask uh yung mga kasama natin dito sa Zoom. So who wants to start first sharing their ideas on this question? How water potential is important in food security. So this time we are talking about the somehow a causality on 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 water and and the plants. Who wants to share their ideas? So po, si Ma'am Teresita. Ma'am Tess? Hello, sir. Okay po, sir. So my idea about uh, the question, how water potential is important in food security? I'm thinking about this, sir. Um, yung Philippines po kasi, um, naturally blessed tayo, abundant tayo sa natural resources. And uh, napapalibutan tayo ng bodies of water. Pero um, in terms of food security, napakatagal na po itong battle cry since the ano pa, panahon pa ng Marcos, eh, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't think na, na, na ano na po ba natin, achieve na po ba natin ang food security kahit minsan? Uh, I Parang think hindi. Generally, if we'll talk about, siguro for individual, for us, probably we have this kind of food security, but we will talk yes, about sir. kabuuan ng Pilipinas. I think, no. Yes, sir. No. Yun nga po yung ironic. So, let us compare it with uh, Israel, which is an arid land. Arid po yung, yung parang disyerto, parang ganun po ano. Pero sila ay na-achieve nila ang food security at ang nakakabilib pa, sila ay nag-export uh, ano, eh, ng products to Europe. So anong problema sa atin sa Philippines? So siguro po um sa sa pinaka problema natin na masasabi ko is yung sa utilization of yung water water resources natin. Kasi meron nga po tayong mga dams, pero yung mga dams po na ito ay hindi pa rin naman po sumasapat in terms of catching the rain. Parang meron po akong article na nabasa na if only the Philippines can um, invest into harvesting the rainwater, maybe po uh, magkakaroon tayo ng parang um, may ano siya sa food security, makakatulong siya malaki sa food security. Lalo na po ngayon, drought. So nag, pagkatapos po ng taniman ngayon, I don't think po na makakapagtanim lahat. Kasi parang down na ang mga farmers. Puro sugal na po nangyari mula sa presyo ng palay, tapos abono, tapos sugal pa dahil nga most are rain-fed areas. So may mga in, meron naman po tayong mga naging program program sa um, government in terms sa ganito pong problema about water. May mga SFR po, may mga water impounding, mga ano pa yung mga shallow tube well, ganito po. Pero hindi pa rin po talaga sumasapat, sir. So, sana po may address po nila talaga yun. Magkaroon tayo ng ano, um, um, national project para ma-harvest yung rainwater. Yun po, sir. Yeah, thank you, Ma'am Tess. Actually, I'm proposing dito sa Loving University, sa campus namin, that 
we set a provision for rainwater harvester sa ating mga buildings uh, dito sa loob ng campus. This is actually a part of our CSET, yung Climate Change Expenditure Tagging, na sana magkaroon na kami ng provision for rainwater harvest, harvester and use this rainwater, process it, use it for, for various purposes. So thank you, Ma'am Tess. So um, Sir Joel also has a additional insight that Israel is investing a lot on precision agriculture. Actually, malaking tulong ang precision and smart agriculture uh, if you will really invest on that. And actually, to cascade yung precision agriculture dun sa pinaka-grass root levels natin. Kasi it, I see this uh, a very good tool. Especially, I saw it with Sarai since I've been working with Sarai. Uh, it's a good tool kasi if we have this kind of smart approaches that they will inform the farmer, oh, you have, it's actually harvest time. Oh, you have, uh, you need to water your plants. Oh, you lack this kind of nutrients. It will really, really be helpful for the, for the farmers to, to do such. So, ayun po. So, who wants to share? Uh, Sir Joel? Um, related po dun sa Israel. In fact, tama po yung sinabi ni Ma'am kanina. Another intervention that they're investing a lot is really on desalination. Yun yung wala sa atin. Um, they have, an, yung Mediterranean Sea, I think yun ang pinakas, I don't know, parang yun yata yung main source nila, eh, Mediterranean eh. They, they get the salt water, ang tawag nila doon, they transform it into sweet water. Uh, I had the chance to visit there a long time ago. Sabi ko, why sweet water? I don't know. Kasi yun lang ang term nilang gusto eh. From salt to sweet. So sweet meaning in in good in a very good context, it can cater to a lot of things. no. Lalo na sa agriculture. So that's, that's um, kaya lang ang desalination kasi uh, it, it really, it's very cost intensive ang ano yan eh. Mataas ang investment. No? Plus it is highly energy intensive. Kasi uh, if you're going to distill it, ang taas ng energy requirement na ipapasok mo para mapaghiwalay mo yung, yung water sa salt. So, um, may climate change ano din yan na effect, repercussion. Kasi uh, depending on what fuel you'll feed to the desalination plant. So, malamang yung environmental, yung carbon footprint, mataas din. No? So, yun yung one angle of looking at it. But then again, it solved a lot of problems no in Israel. Now, um, sa atin po sa Philippine setting, going to the main question po, this is very important kasi if I'm not mistaken po, lalo na uh, in the current situation po, I think siguro around 75% pa ng agricultural areas ng Philippines are rain-fed. No? And the remaining are, irrig are under irrigated conditions. Ngayon, another situation in the irrig yung mga irrigable areas, um, Well, the current irrigation program, parang yun, out of the total target na irrigation target, parang halos one-third, wala pa yata ang kalahati ang nalalagyan ng irrigasyon. So the, there, there is really a huge uh, ano to, yung opportunity uh, cost here. Eh. Kasi in, in that 75% rain-fed condition, Ironically, diyan pa karamihan kinukuha ang pagkain natin. So we really need to put in a lot of effort so that kumbaga, yung ating rain-fed agriculture, mas ma-maximize natin yung productivity niya. Na for example, yung rain-fed rice, no? Um pagka rain-fed kasi usually isa lang eh. Pag irrigated dalawa. In fact, there was a time yung quick turnaround na tinawag sa DA no, nagiging tatlo pa yung ano yung cropping season but i think that is to the detriment of the soil <laughs> mangyayari diyan so kung magagawa po natin talaga yung ma-intensify natin yung effort na yung irrigation problem natin in whatever form uh, whether it is national irrigation system communal mga sweep ay mas ma-position ma ma natin halos lahat ng komunidad meron kasi yan po ang solusyon diyan uh, okay. Meron nga po yung dating sekretary ng agriculture noon sabi niya we are a country of irony eh, sabi niya when it rains it pours ang dami nagrereklamo bumabaha dito lubog lahat pero pagka naman dry pagka naman nasa dry season 
nagre-reklamo sa tubig. So it's a country of irony, sabi niya eh. So yun po, I think there is really a good, there should be a very aggressive program for us to irrigate what can be irrigated para yung food security ma-attain. Ngayon po, last point na lang po no, regarding food security. I'd like to share about food security and its difference no, between food security and food sufficiency. Ang laki po ng diferensya nun. When we are aiming for food security, Food security is actually physical and economic access to food. No, um, food security is uh, accessibility, availability, affordability of safe, nutritious food at all times. Um, in fact, it does not say that you cannot import. In fact, you can import. It you just have to need to secure, ensure that may food ka in the table, available for access at affordable means and safe no ang kaibahan po niyan sa food self sufficiency which i believe wala pa talaga tayo niyan food sufficiency in fact parang food sovereignty na yan eh ah uh, you have total access to what you need and you need not source it elsewhere yun ang gusto natin talaga mangyari kasi we would want to avoid the situation where we have money to buy and we have nowhere else to buy from kasi yung climate change po tinatamaan ng Pilipinas tinatamaan din ng ibang bansa. So what happens? Uh, for example, uh, yung Thailand, Vietnam, kung atamaan sila ng problema at they will resort to domestic, you know, they will resort to restricting to domestic acts, protecting their own, hindi sila maglalabas. Paano yeah. tayo? Paano tayo, di ba? Kagaya nung naging problema sa, ano to, yung India noon, kasi yung Ukraine, Russia, uh, source ng Ukraine, wheat, di ba? Wheat. Yung India, na problema sila, hindi na rin sila naglabas ng wheat. Tumaas ang cost ng feeds. Yung Malaysia, hindi naglabas ng manok. E iyan yung kinukuha na natin eh. So, before that, we are food secure kasi we're getting from these countries. Pero paano ngayon? No, yun, ang, yun ang problema. So, we really have to drive for sufficiency. Kaya lang, uh, in fact, yun din po ang gusto ng ating sekretary, presidente, na ensure that we have Uh, availability of food. No? Food production ang focus eh, ng DA ngayon. So, yun po. Just to share about um, food security. For, uh, thank you po. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in connection also to that, um, I think it's also important kasi uh, in terms of SDG, if I think it's SDG number 15, Responsible Consumption and Production. So, uh, I think, ito yung sabi nung advisor ko, professor ko dati. Ang sabi niya sa akin is, Uh, yeah, we're addressing food production, but we're not. Ad we are not addressing the consumption side. So, what does this mean? It will fo uh, boils down to on subpopulation. So, wala tayong mechanism in the population control per se. Kung baga, um, we're not that as strict as China in terms of implementing family planning or one child policy, two child policy. So ang point ni nung advisor ko, just to share it with the class, is that we look also in, we should also look into the consumption side because these are the mouth that will feed on that you will what you will produce. So to attain food security at the same time as mentioned by Sir Joel, to attain food sufficiency in a certain country, we have to look both sides as well. So uh, as we're not kumaga, uh, we, we should not just only look on the one one side of the spectrum. So, ayun yun. And I, I really believe on this um, because if you will look into the theory of demographic transition, this is very population, social science, uh, theory, of popula uh, theory of demographic transition. As a country goes to an industrialized country, mababa yung kanyang population, at the same time, uh, na-address nila yung ibang economic needs and food needs nila. So, That's uh, this is the theory of demographic transition wants to tell us at yun sa na ma implement natin din siya kasi though it will entail a lot of cost sabi nga it will entail a lot of money to to be an industrialized country kasi sumasabay once you go to an industrialized country sumasabay yung mindset din ng mga tao kasi when you go into an industrialized country everyone is literate 
Yung parang yun yung concept to dun eh. Everyone is literate. Everyone understand what you want to try to say. And at this point in time, for the Philippines, we're not yet on that point. So, siguro, I don't know, hopefully in this kind, in the administration that we have now, uh, with the Marcoses, uh, with the Marcos administration, uh, addressing this food security, addressing food sufficiency will be attainable. So, at, but as I mentioned, we also need to look to the other side of the spectrum, population. So there's also need to see yung population, the mouths that will feed on what we will produce. So thank you, uh, Sir Joel. Ayun, so, ayun, uh, my comment pala si Sir Joel that population growth far exceeds agricultural output growth. Yeah, that's very true. Kaya tayo nagkakaroon din nakakulangan. And it's very sad to say that in the past months, there are a lot of news that we are importing a lot of goods, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, agricultural products, uh, sugar and other, considering we used to be uh, the exporters in the Southeast Asia. Ayan. So other, other uh, ideas? Uh, going back to our question, doon sa ating food security, the water potential. Na po ba? Okay. So, uh, I think that ends our presentation for today. Doon sa last slide, I will just share the slide, the canvas slide that I'm using. Doon sa last slide, there is a very, very good video. Um, it's quite long, kaya hindi ko na siya ipapresent dito. You can just watch it on your time. Uh, it's a very good video explaining, though very, very technical siya, but it's a very good explanation on water potential and doon sa crop production. So you just need to watch it. I'll share the link doon sa Canva and then you, just, you can just play it around. So uh, water is very much important. So sabi nga, you cannot live without water. So you can live without any other food, but you cannot actually live without water because our cells, basically, it's composed of water. So it maintains it maintains a balance. Now, um, challenge sa atin for for the country, it's we have we are we are surrounded by we are surrounded by water resources. We are we have a plentiful of rain during rainy season. Uh, it's a matter on on how we will maintain the water. So, kailangan natin i-maintain yung water budget natin dito sa bansa para hindi tayo magkaroon ng kakulangan or in excess of water. So, the excess water, it may cause flooding doon sa mga, malulunod yung mga ibang halaman. Now, doon sa loss naman, of course, magkukulangan tayo ng nutrients doon sa ating mga crops without the water. Kasi it, it transport. It's actually the, the medium of transport of these nutrients from the soil going to, to the trees, going to the plants, going to the shrubs, to going to the different types of crops that we are growing. So that's how important water it is. And if you're related to the food security, if you're related to the sustainable development, malaki yung magiging role nito. So I think that as I mentioned, that ends our presentation, our discussion for today. So it's very technical. May mga formula, may mga types of, uh, may mga terminologies that we have already encountered during our younger years uh, in, in high school, in college. But these are very much important if you would like to discuss how plants may be able to adapt to, to this water loss and water excess. So... I request everyone to turn on their cameras for our documentation for today. Ayan. Ayan po. So, ayan, so mambel na lang. Okay, in count of three. So, one, two, three. So, again, in count of three. Isa pa. One, two, three. So, ayun po. so by next week, we'll have the, the Pecha Pucha, the, the presentation. So, ilang presentations po tayo by next week? Four? Or, yeah, four. Four presentations by, by next week. And we'll also tackle yung pong temperature natin. Temperature relations naman tayo next week. 
So I hope your yung mga questions that I'm trying to throw you um nare-recall po natin sila because uh, in your final exam I think I will pick among these questions. I say I think we're not we're done with with objective type of questions. Uh, I think for masters for graduate school uh, on how you reason out yun yung kailangan nating makita. So on how we justify things based on our existing knowledge and based on the literatures that we have read. So ayan po. So thank you for your participation today. Again, happy birthday, Sir Joel. Enjoy your day. And you. uh, let's have uh, a very good lunch. So again po, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank so you Thank you po. Happy birthday, Sir. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you everyone. Birthday po. Yeah. Thank yes. you. And, ayan po. So thank you very much.